Hare Krishna everyone, welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books where we made a vow to read Srila Prabhupada's books at least for an hour and then uh, have reflections and discussions and questions and answers. It's the only place on the planet where you can go every single day and hear at least an hour of Srila Prabhupada's books re read out straight. You know, we like our we we like we we'll, we'll take our prop but straight. Thank you. <laughs> How do you like your coffee? Straight, not with cream. No, we like our prop but straight. No, nothing added or subtracted. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to all of you out there in cyberspace. Don't forget, there's now a YouTube channel and it has the same name, Daily Readings of Srila Prabhupada's Books, and there you will find all, actually all, of the uh, Facebook readings, videos, you'll find them now. They're all, he finished it. And I can't believe he did it that fast, but he did. I went on and I saw for myself. You know, the whole Bhagavatam, the whole Bhagavad Gita, and other things. And then we'll do Chaitanya Church and read the next. Okay, <clears throat> Sanatana Goswami. We say this prayer every day in order to get us into the mood. Srimad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram by Sanatana Goswami. The glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it goes like this Sarva Shastra Dipi Yusha, Sarva Vedaika Satpala, Sarva Siddhanta Ratnaja. Sarva Lokaika Drik Prada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, <clears throat> you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kalidvan Dudita Ditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, <clears throat> you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prima Varshakshalayate, Sarvada Sarvasevyaya, <clears throat> Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you who were supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Madekabando Matsangin, Madguru Mad Mahadana, Manistadaga Mad Bhagya, Mad Anandana Mostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune. My source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. <clears throat> Asadu saduta dayin, atini chochata kada, hanamun chagadachin mam, prem narit kanta yospura. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Okay, we reach the eleventh chapter of the eleventh canto. <clears throat> Krishna is continuing to enlighten further Uddhava. Of course, Uddhava is fully enlightened already, but somebody who is fully enlightened, you can save even more than a person to a person who is not. So this is for the benefit of everyone else after Krishna leaves, because he wants Uddhava to deliver his message to the sages at Madhuri Kasham and elsewhere in the Himalayas where he didn't go. That was the only place in India that he didn't go. <clears throat> so in this chapter, 
uh, the symptoms of the conditioned and the liberated souls are given. So here we're going to hear, we had a discussion towards the end of our reading yesterday uh, about, you know, what's the difference between the conditioned soul and the liberated soul and how do you tell. So now Krishna himself <coughs> is going to address this issue and explain it to us in detail. And we read the summary, or not? Yes, we did read the summary. <clears throat> One. <clears throat> the Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Uddhava, due to the influence of the material modes of nature, which are under my control, the living entity is sometimes designated as conditioned, and sometimes as liberated. In fact, however, the soul is never really bound up or liberated. Since I am the Supreme Lord of Maya, which is the cause of the modes of nature, I am also never to be considered liberated or in bondage. This was addressing Prana's point yesterday. <clears throat> Purport. <clears throat> In this chapter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, explains the different characteristics of conditioned and liberated life, the symptoms by which we can, one can recognize saintly persons, and the various processes of devotional service to the Lord. In the previous chapter, Uddhava inquired from the Lord how conditioned and liberated life are possible. <clears throat> the Lord now replies that Uddhava's question is somewhat superficial. <clears throat> Since the pure spirit soul is never entangled in the material energy of the Lord, the living entity, the living entity imagines a false connection with the three modes of nature and accepts the material body as the self. The living entity, therefore, suffers the consequences of his own imagination, just as one suffers the illusory activities of a dream. <clears throat> this does not indicate that the material world is illusory in the sense that it is non-existent. The material world is certainly real, being the potency of the personality of Godhead and the living entity, being the superior potency of God, is also real. But the living entity's dream of being part and parcel of the material world <clears throat> is an illusion that drags him into the contradictory state called material conditioned life. Shall I read that again? The material world is certainly real being the potency of the personality of Godhead and the living being being the superior potency of God is also real. But the living entity's dream of being part and parcel of the material world is an illusion that drags him into the contradictory state called material conditioned life. The living entity is never actually bhata or bound up. This was on this point yesterday, which we were talking about. The living entity is never actually buddha or bound up, since he merely imagines a false connection with the material world. Because there is ultimately no permanent connection between the living entity and matter, there is no actual liberation. The living entity being eternally transcendental to the inferior material energy of the Lord is eternally liberated. Lord Krishna reveals that in one sense the living entity is factually not bound up and thus cannot be liberated. But in another sense the terms bondage and liberation can be conveniently applied to indicate the particular situation of the individual soul who is the marginal potency of the Lord. 
Although the individual soul is never actually bound to matter, he suffers the reactions of material nature because of false identification. And thus the term buddha or bound up may be used to indicate the nature of your living entity's experience within the inferior energy of the Lord. Since buddha <coughs> describes a false situation, freedom from such a false situation may also be described as moksha or liberation. Therefore, the terms bondage and liberation are acceptable if one understands that such terms only refer to temporary situations created by illusion and do not refer to the ultimate nature of the living entity. In this verse, Lord Krishna states, Gunasya maya mulatvan name moksho nabandhanam the terms liberation and bondage can never be applied to the Supreme Personality of Godhead since He is the Absolute Truth and the Supreme Controller of everything. Lord Krishna is eternally the Supreme Transcendental Entity and He can never be bound by illusion. It is the duty of the illusory potency of the Personality of Godhead to attract the living entities to ignorance by creating the false impression of a blissful existence separate from Lord Krishna. The illusory conception of existence apart from the personality of God it is called maya or material illusion. Since Lord Krishna is the supreme absolute controller of maya, there is no possibility that maya could have any influence over the personality of Godhead. Thus the term bandhanam or bondage cannot be applied to the eternal, blissful, and omniscient personality of Godhead. The term moksha or liberation indicating freedom from bandhana is equally ir irrelevant to the Lord. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has commented on this verse as follows The Supreme Personality of Godhead is endowed with great spiritual potencies. Because of mundane concoction, the conditioned soul imagines that the absolute truth is devoid of variegated spiritual potencies by which he may enjoy blissful life. Although the living entity is the spiritual potency of the Lord, he is presently situated in the inferior, illusory potency, and by engaging in mental speculation, he becomes bound in conditioned life. Liberation means that the living entity should transfer himself to the spiritual potency of the Lord, which can be divided into three categories, Ladini, the potency of bliss, Sandini, the potency of eternal existence, and Sambit, the potency of omniscience. <clears throat> <clears throat> Since the personality of Godhead is eternally endowed <clears throat> with a pure existence of bliss and knowledge, he is never conditioned or liberated. The living entity, however, being entangled in the Lord's material potency, <clears throat> sometimes is sometimes conditioned and sometimes liberated. The neutral, original state of the three modes of nature is called maya. <clears throat> when the three modes of nature interact, one of them will become powerful, subordinating the other two modes until another mode becomes prominent. In this way, the three can be distinguished in their variety of manifestation. <clears throat> Although the threefold material potency expands from the personality of Godhead, the Lord Himself, in His personal form, is the actual abode of the three spiritual potencies, namely, eternality, bliss, and knowledge. <clears throat> if one desires to become free from the entanglement of conditioned life within the material sky, called the kingdom of Maya, one must come to the spiritual sky, wherein the living entities are filled with bliss, <clears throat> possess eternal spiritual bodies, and engage in the loving devotional service of the Lord. By developing one's eternal spiritual form in the loving service of the Lord, oh, Oh, Hare Krishna, Bhakti John. How nice to see you. 
We're learning all about the difference between a living, living being, a Kedisha soul, and a liberated soul. Welcome aboard. <laughs> <coughs> if one desires to become free from the entanglement of conditioned life within the material sky, called the kingdom of Maya, one must come to the spiritual sky, wherein the living entities are filled with bliss, possess eternal spiritual bodies, and engage in the loving devotional service of the Lord. By developing one's eternal spiritual form in the loving service of the Lord, one immediately transcends the duality of conditioned life and in personal liberation can directly experience the spiritual potencies of the Lord. I'll read that again. <clears throat> By developing one's eternal spiritual form in the loving service of the Lord, one immediately transcends the duality of conditioned life and impersonal liberation, and can directly experience the spiritual potencies of the Lord. At that time, there is no possibility of false identification with the material world. Realizing oneself to be eternal spirit soul, the living entity can understand that he is never truly connected to matter because he is part of the superior energy of the Lord. Therefore, both material bondage and liberation are ultimately meaningless within the reality of the spiritual sky. The living entity is the marginal potency of the Lord and should, and should ex exercise his free will to engage in the pure devotional service of the Lord. By reviving one's eternal spiritual body, one can understand oneself to be a minute, a minute particle of the spiritual potency of the Lord. In other words, the living entity is a minute particle of eternity, bliss, and omniscience, and thus in full Christian consciousness there is no possibility of his being carried away by the illusion of the three modes of nature. In conclusion, it may be stated that the individual living entity is never actually entangled in matter and is thus not liberated although his illusory state may be accurately described as entangled and liberated. <laughs> A chincha beta beta. Inconceivable. On the other hand, <clears throat> the Supreme Personality of Godhead is eternally situated in his own spiritual potencies and can never be described as being bound up. And thus there is no meaning to the concept of the Lord's freeing himself from such a non-existent condition. Text 2. <clears throat> Just as a dream is merely a creation of one's intelligence but has no actual substance. <clears throat> Similarly, material lamentation, illusion, happiness, distress, and the acceptance of the material body under the influence of maya are all creations of my illusory energy. In other words, material existence has no essential reality. Purport. The word deha apiti, apiti indicates that the living entity falsely identifies himself with the external material body and thus transmigrates from one body to another. Apiti also indicates great suffering or misfortune. Because of such false identification <clears throat> under the influence of illusion, the living entity experiences the miserable symptoms described here. Maya means the false concept that anything can exist without Lord Krishna or for that or for any purpose other than the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Although the conditioned living entities are trying to enjoy material sense gratification, the result is always painful, and such painful experiences turn the conditioned soul back toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hmm. In other words, the ultimate purpose of the material creation is to bring the living entity back to the loving devotional service of the Lord. Therefore, even the sufferings of the material world may be seen as the transcendental mercy of the Personality of Godhead. That's it. 
that's the answer right there. Therefore, in other words, the ultimate purpose of the material creation is to bring the living entity back to the loving devotional service of the Lord. Therefore, even the sufferings of the material world may be seen as the transcendental mercy of the Personality of Godhead. The conditioned soul, imagining that material objects are meant for his personal enjoyment, brief, bitterly laments the loss of such objects. <coughs> <laughs> In this verse, the example is given of a dream in which the material intelligence creates many illusory objects. Similarly, our polluted material consciousness creates the false impression of material sense gratification. But this phantasmagoria, being devoid of Christian consciousness, has no real existence. By surrendering to polluted material consciousness, the living entity is afflicted with innumerable troubles. The only solution is to see Lord Krishna within everything and everything within Lord Krishna. Thus one understands that Lord Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, the proprietor of everything, and the well-wishing friend of all living entities. In material illusion there is no understanding of one's eternal spiritual body, nor is there knowledge of the absolute truth. Therefore, Material existence, even in, even in its most sophisticated or pious form, is always foolishness. One should not misunderstand the example of the dream to mean that the material world has no real existence. That's why yesterday I, I went like that, to indicate that it's real, but it's temporary. One should not misunderstand the example of the dream to mean that the material world has no existence. Material nature is the manifestation of the Lord's external potency, just as the spiritual sky is the manifestation of the Lord's internal potency. Although material objects are subject to transformation and thus have no permanent existence, the material energy is real because it comes from the Supreme Reality, Lord Krishna. It is only our false acceptance of the material body as the factual self and our foolish dream that the material world is meant for our pleasure that, that have no real existence. They are merely mental concoctions. One should, one should cleanse in oneself of material designations and wake up to the all-pervading reality of the Personality of Godhead Lord Krishna. Text 3. O Uddhava, both knowledge and ignorance, being products of Maya, are expansions of my potency. Both knowledge and ignorance are beginningless and perpetually award liberation and bondage to embodied living beings. Purport. By the expansion of Vidya, this was the, somebody answered, asked this question. Oh, yeah, it was maybe Matthew. Vidya and Avidya. Oh no, it was it was. So, was it you? You asked Vidya and how Vidya and Avidya can be, you know, products of Maya. Here it is, right here. By the expansion of Vidya, or knowledge, a conditioned soul is liberated from the clutches of Maya. And similarly, by the expansion of avidya, or ignorance, the conditioned soul is driven further into illusion and bondage. Both knowledge and ignorance are products of the mighty potency of the Personality of Godhead. The living being is bound by illusion when he considers himself the proprietor of the subtle and gross material bodies. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, the living entity may be designated as Jiva Maya, whereas matter is called Gunamaya. <clears throat> the living entity places his living potency, Jiva Maya, in the grip of the mundane qualitative potency, Gunamaya, and falsely dreams 
that he is part and parcel of the material world. Such an artificial mixture is called illusion or ignorance. When all of the Lord's potencies are correctly perceived in their proper categories, the living entity is liberated from material bondage and returns to his blissful, eternal residence in the spiritual sky. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is not different from his potencies, yet he is always above them as the Supreme Controller. The Supreme Personality of Godhead may be designated as Mukta, or liberated, only to indicate that he is eternally free from material contamination, and never to indicate that the Lord has been freed from actual entanglement in a material situation. According to Srila Madhvacharya, Vidya indicates the Goddess of Fortune, the internal potency of the Lord, whereas Avidya indicates Durga, the external potency of the Lord. Ultimately, however, the Personality of Godhead can transform His potencies according to His own desire, as explained by Śrīla Prabhupāda in his commentary on Śrīmad-Bhāgavatam 1.3.34, quote, Because the Lord is the absolute transcendence, all of His forms, names, pastimes, attributes, associates, and energies are identical with Him. <clears throat> his transcendental energy acts according to His omnipotency. The same energy acts as his external, internal, and marginal energies. And by his omnip omnipotency, he can perform anything and everything through the agency of any of the above energies. He can turn the external energy into internal by his will. Srila Sridhar Swami notes in this regard, that although the Lord has explained in the first verse of this chapter that the living entity is never actually in bond bondage and therefore never actually liberated, one may apply the terms bondage and liberation if one remembers that the living entity is eternally a transcendental fragment of the Personality of Godhead. Further, <clears throat> one should not misinterpret the words mayaya, may, vinirmite, to indicate that both material bondage and liberation are temporary states, being creations of the potency of the Lord. Therefore, the term adye, <coughs> or primeval and eternal, is used in this verse. The vidya <coughs> and avidya potencies of the Lord are stated to be creations of maya, that was the point I made to you yesterday. Vidya and avidya potencies of the Lord are stated to be creations of maya because they carry out the functions of the Lord's potencies. The vidya potency engages the living entities in the Lord's pastimes, whereas the avidya potency engages the living entities in forgetting the Lord and merging into darkness. Actually, both knowledge and ignorance are eternal alternatives of the, of the marginal potency of the Lord. And in this sense, it is not incorrect to, say, to state that the living entity is either eternally conditioned or eternally liberated. The term vinirmite, or produced, in this case, indicates that the Lord expands his own energy, his knowledge, and ignorance, which display the functions of the Lord's internal and external potencies. Such potential exhibitions may appear and disappear at different times, places, and circumstances, but material bondage and spiritual freedom are e eternal options of the marginal potency of the Lord. Text 4 O most intelligent Uddhava, the living entity called Jiva is part and parcel of me. But due to ignorance, he has been suffering in material bondage since time immemorial. By knowledge, however, he can be liberated. Purport. Just as the sun 
reveals itself through its own light or covers itself by creating clouds. The Personality of Godhead reveals and covers himself by knowledge and ignorance, which are expansions of his potency. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 7.5, Aparyam itastvanyam prakritim vidime param jivabhutam mahabaho yayidam daryate jagat. Besides this inferior nature, O mighty armed Arjuna, there is a superior energy of mind consisting of all living entities who are struggling with material nature and are sustaining the universe. Srila Prabhupada states in connection with this verse, quote, The Supreme Lord Krishna is the only controller and all living entities are controlled by Him. These living entities are His superior energy because the quality of their existence is one and the same with the Supreme, but they are never equal to the Lord in quantity of power. Because of quantitative inferiority of potency, the living entity becomes covered by Maya and is again liberated by surrendering to the Lord. The word Anksha, or part and parcel, is also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita 15.7. Mamai Bangsho, Jivaloke, Jivabhuta, Sanatana. The living entity is Anksha, or a minute particle, and therefore subject to liberation and bondage. As stated in the Vishnu Purana, Vishnu Shakti Paraprokta, Chetra Gyakya Tata Para, Avidya Karma Sam Gyanya, Chitiya Shakti Ishite. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu possesses his superior and internal potency as well as the potency called Chetragya Shakti. This Chetragya Shakti <coughs> is also spiritual potency, but it is sometimes covered by the third or material potency called ignorance. Thus, because of ver the, the various stages of covering, the second or marginal potency is manifested in different evolutionary phases. Srila Bhaktivedanta Thakur has written that the living entity has been executing fruitive activities since time immemorial. Thus his conditioned life may be called beginningless. Since conditioned life, however, is not endless, since the living entity may achieve liberation through the loving devotional service of the Lord. Since the living entity may acquire liberation, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur states that his liberated life begins at a certain point but is endless because liberated life is understood to be eternal. In any case, one who has achieved the shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna may be understood to be eternally liberated. Since such a person has entered into the eternal atmosphere of the spiritual sky, since there is no material time in the spiritual sky, one who has achieved his eternal spiritual body on Lord Krishna's planet is not subject to the influence of time. His eternal blissful life with Krishna is not designated in terms of material past, present, and future, and is therefore called eternal liberation. Material time is conspicuous by its absence in the spiritual sky, and every living entity there is eternally liberated, having attained the supreme situation such liberation can be achieved by vidya, or perfect knowledge, which is understood in three phases called Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan, as described in Srimad Bhagavatam. The ultimate phase of vidya, or knowledge, is to be understood, is to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Bhagavad Gita, such knowledge is called Raja Vidya or the king of all knowledge, and it awards the supreme liberation.
Sorry, that's me. Text 5. Raja Vidya. Mm -hmm. Text 3. Text 5. Thus, my dear Uddhava, in the same material body, we find opposing characteristics, such as great happiness and misery. That is because both the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is eternally liberated, as well as the conditioned soul, are within the body. I shall now speak to you about their different characteristics. Purport. In verse 36 of the previous chapter, Uddhava inquired about the different symptoms of liberated and conditioned life. Srila Sridhar Swami explains that the characteristics of bondage and liberation may be understood in two divisions, as the difference between the ordinary conditioned soul and the eternally liberated personality of Godhead, or as the difference between conditioned and liberated living entities in the jiva category. The Lord will first explain the difference between the ordinary living entity and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which may be understood as the difference between the controlled and the controller. You, did you get that? There's a difference between the jiva and the Supreme, and, and, and the difference between the conditioned jiva and the liberated jiva. Text 6. <clears throat> By chance, two birds have made a nest together in the same tree. The two birds are friends and are of a similar nature. One of them, however, is eating the fruits of the tree, whereas the other, who does not eat the fruits, is in a superior position due to his potency. Purport. The example of two birds in the same tree is given to illustrate, illustrate the presence within the heart of the material body of both the individual soul and the super soul, <clears throat> the personality of Godhead. Just as a bird makes a nest in a tree, the living entity sits within the heart. The example is appropriate because the bird is always distinct from the tree. Similarly, both the individual soul and the super-soul are distinct entities separate from the temporary material body. The word balena indicates that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is satisfied by his own internal potency, which consists of eternality, omniscience, and bliss. As indicated by the word bulyan, or having superior existence, the Supreme Lord is always in a superior position, whereas the living entity is sometimes in illusion and sometimes enlightened. The word balena indicates that the Lord is never in darkness or ignorance, but is always full in his perfect blissful consciousness. Thus the Lord is nirana, or uninterested in the bitter fruits of material activities whereas the ordinary conditioned soul busily consumes such bitter fruits, thinking them to be sweet. Ultimately, the fruit of all material endeavor is death, but the living entity foolishly thinks material things will bring him, bring him pleasure. The word sakayao, or two friends, is also significant. Our real friend is Lord Krishna, who is situated within our heart. Only He knows our actual needs, and only He can give us real happiness. Lord Krishna is so kind that He patiently sits in the heart, trying to guide the conditioned soul back home, back to Godhead. Certainly no material friend would remain with his foolish companion for millions of years, <laughs> especially if his companion were to ignore him or even curse him. But Lord Krishna is such a faithful, loving friend that he accompanies even the most demoniac living entity and is also in the heart of the insect, pig, and dog. That is because Lord Krishna is supremely Krishna, con Krishna conscious. 
<laughs> that is because Lord Krishna is supremely Krishna conscious <laughs> and sees every living entity as part and parcel of himself. Every living being should give up the bitter fruits of the tree of material existence. One should turn one's face to the Lord within the heart and revive one's eternal loving relationship with, one, with one's real friend, Lord Krishna. The word sadrishao, of similar or of similar nature, indicates that both the living entity and the personality of Godhead are conscious entities. As part and parcel of the Lord, we share the Lord's nature, but in infinitesimal quantity. Thus, the Lord and the living entity are sadrishao. A similar statement is found in the Shvetashvatara Upanishad. For six, Dwao su parna sadyuja sakaya samanam riksham parishasvajayate jayate to your anyak pipalam svadyatai atati ashnan anashnan anyo bichak chakshiti bichak kashiti. There are two birds in one tree. One of them is eating the fruits of the tree, while the other is witnessing the actions. The witness is the Lord, and the fruit eater is the living entity. What are you? I'm a fruit eater. Take seven. Or like that cardinal, a fighting. Nothing. Okay. The bird who does not eat the fruits of the tree is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who by his omniscience perfectly understands his own position and that of the conditioned living entity, represented by the eating bird. That living entity, on the other hand, does not understand himself or the Lord. He is covered by ignorance and is thus called eternally conditioned whereas the personality of Godhead, being full of perfect knowledge, is eternally liberated. Purport. The word vidya maya in this verse indicates the internal potency of the Lord and not the external potency, maha maya. Within the material world, there is vidya, here this is the answer to your question. Within the material world, there is vidya, or material science, and avidya, or material ignorance. But in this verse, vidya means the internal spiritual knowledge by which the personality of God is fixed in omniscience. So this is the source of confusion. When we hear, hear the word vidya, depending on its context, it's talking about uh, the material knowledge <coughs> that takes us towards the spiritual energy. And in another context, vidya means the yoga maya, or the spiritual energy of the Lord, which gives devotional service. The material science, vidya, cannot give devotional service. But it can give us understanding that I'm not properly situated here and takes us in the direction of real knowledge. Vidya. I'll read this again. Maybe it may, maybe that will clarify it. The word Vidya Maya in this verse indicates the internal potency of the Lord and not the external potency, Mahamaya. Within the material world, there is Vidya, or material science, and Avidya, or material ignorance. But in this verse, Vidya means the internal spiritual knowledge by which the personality of God it is fixed in omniscience. The example of two birds in a tree, which is given in many Vedic, Vedic literatures, demonstrates the statement, nityo nityanam, there are two categories of living entities, namely the Supreme Lord and the minute jiva soul. The conditioned jiva soul, forgetting his identity as an eternal servant of the Lord, tries to enjoy the fruits of his own activities 
and thus comes under the spell of ignorance. This bondage of ignorance has existed since time immemorial and can be rectified only by one's taking to the loving devotional service of the Lord, which is full of spiritual knowledge. In conditioned life, the living entity is forced by the laws of nature to engage in pious and impious fruitive activities. But the liberated position of every living entity is to offer the fruits of his work to the Lord, the Supreme Enjoyer. It should be understood that even when the living entity is in a liberated condition, his knowledge is never equal in quantity to that of the Personality of Godhead. Even Lord Brahma, the Supreme Living Entity within this universe, acquires only partial knowledge of the Personality of Godhead and His potencies. In the Bhagavad Gita 4.5, the Lord explains His superior knowledge to Arjuna. Mahuni me vititani, janmani tapacharjana, tanyaham bedasarvani, na tvam beta parantapa. The Supreme Personality of God had said, Many, many births, both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot, O subduer of the enemy. The term Bada, or bound, is also understood to refer to the living entity's eternal dependence upon the Lord. Either in the condition, this is, this is nice, listen to this, careful. The term bada or bound is also understood to refer to the living entity's eternal dependence upon the Lord, either in the conditioned or liberated state. In the kingdom of Maya, the living entity is bound to the cruel laws of birth and death, whereas in the spiritual sky, the living entity is fixed in a bond of love to the Lord. Liberation means freedom from the miseries of life, but never freedom from one's loving relationship with Lord Krishna, which is the essence of one's eternal existence. According to Srila Madhvacharya, the Lord is the only eternally free living entity, and all other living entities are eternally dependent and bound to the Lord, either through blissful loving service or through the bondage of maya. The conditioned soul should give up tasting the bitter fruits of the tree of material existence and turn to his dear most friend, Lord Krishna, who is sitting within his heart. There is no pleasure equal to or greater than the pleasure of pure devotional service to Lord Krishna. And by tasting the fruit of love of Krishna, the liberated living entity enters the ocean of happiness. What a purport. Hare Krishna. You could study that purport for a few years before you can get your mind around it. Text 8. You know, I liked Giri Raj Maharaj's point. While he was here, we were reading one of these really complex, intricate, but deep and enlightening, actually, purports. And Max, when we had, remember, when we had a revel, he, he said, isn't it, he said, I like that Prabhupada could explain all these things in very simple terms. And we understood it even before we got all these, you know, complicated ideas and books and everything. Who was I talking with? One of the first devotees, they were, it was, yeah, it was Malati the other day when she called. She was telling me how when we first started in London, we didn't have any books. We just said Prabhupada remembered what he, because they had the first three volumes that came from India. That was it. Okay. Now, I have to make a decision. I need to get here. The decision maker is going, and I have to make a decision. What's going on here? All right, Hare Krishna, Nitya. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
The question is to, to stop now or to keep going? Keep going? Okay. Text 8. <clears throat> One who is enlightened in self-realization, although living within the material body, sees himself as transcendental to the body. Just as one who has arisen from a dream gives up identification with the dream body. I can see the wheels turning in Prana's head from here. A foolish person, however, although not identical with his material body, but transcendental to it, thinks himself to be situated in the body, just as one who is dreaming sees himself as situated in an imaginary body. Yeah, sometimes you're dreaming and you, and you don't. Sometimes you're dreaming and you realize you're dreaming. I don't know if you've had that experience. I've had it lots of times, especially recently. But sometimes in a dream, you just are absorbed in the, what you're doing in the dream and you, you don't even think, oh, this is a dream. You, you're absorbed in what you're doing and what's happening to you. And it's the same in this, that's, that's the point that's being made in all these purports. It's the same when we're in our gross physical body. It's just that it, it seems like real because we seem to be here a lot longer than in the dream. But from Krishna's point of view, our whole existence in the material world is just eh, a blink of the eye. Prabhupada once told us, when you go back to the spiritual world, it's just like you woke up from a dream. Oh, oops. <laughs> or it's like a nightmare, rather. Because that's talking about time relative. There is no time in the spiritual world. No past, present, or future. Therefore, when we, Krishna, for Krishna, it's just a blink of an eye, and 311, 311 trillion years go by of our time. Just think about it. It's inconceivable. Okay. So liberation means to remember that this body is not this is not our real state and be conscious of it and there's other places where Prabhupada says that while you're in that state you still eat you sleep, you bathe you do all the things you do but it's going on like like just on the automatic pilot you know like the you know the fan that still goes around you turn it off but it still goes around even though it's not connected and gradually it slows down and stops Purport. In Lord Krishna's discussion of the different characteristics of liberated and conditioned souls, the Lord first clarified the, the, the distinction between the eternally liberated personality of Godhead and the marginal potency, the innumerable jivas, who are sometimes conditioned and sometimes liberated. In this and the next nine verses, the Lord describes the different symptoms of liberated and conditioned jiva souls. In a dream, one sees oneself in an imaginary body, but upon waking, one gives up all identification with that body. Similarly, one who was awakened to Krishna consciousness no longer identifies with the gross or subtle material bodies, nor does he become affected by the happiness and distress of material life. That would be nice. On the other hand, a foolish person, Kumati, does not awaken from the dream of material existence and is afflicted with innumerable problems due to false identification with the gross and subtle material bodies. 
one should become situated in one's eternal spiritual identity, nitya sarupa, by properly identifying oneself as the eternal servant of Krishna. One becomes relieved of his false material identity and, and therefore the miseries of illusory existence immediately cease just as the anxiety of a troublesome dream ceases as soon as one awakens to his normal, pleasant surroundings. It should be understood, however, that the analogy of awakening from a dream should never be applied to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is never an illusion. That's why when you said yesterday that the, the, the soul is never illusioned, is never uh, affected, I, I reacted kind of a little bit because if I take that to the conclusion then I may think I'm Krishna. There may be no distinction between me and Krishna because I can misidentify myself with the material energy, but Krishna cannot. The Lord is eternally awake and enlightened by his own unique category called Vishnu Tattva. Such knowledge is easily understood by one who is Vidvan or enlightened in Krishna consciousness. So that should be our goal and our, our ambition. Uh, Rupa Goswami said, if you want to be able to live in this material world peacefully, you should make it your ambition to serve Krishna. Even if it's just your ambition, if you're just, if you're just trying but you can't do it yet, you can live in this world happily. But if it's not your ambition, then you'll suffer like a wounded dog or some other creature. Okay, I will stop here. And it's already 13 after 7. And we'll go on to our next part of our program, our open mic, where we can hear the reflections and whatever of the assembled sages. Deep stuff. Mm -hmm. Eh? Deep stuff. I'll start the ball rolling. Jiva Goswami encapsulates all that what we just heard in a, in, a, in a simple analogy. And you've heard it. We've all, we've all heard it lots and lots of times. But at, sometimes when you hear it at the right moment, it opens up doors. Try to understand what we're talking about. The Mayavadis, they say that the soul is actually doesn't exist. And avidya is just, you know, I mean, they can't really explain how come there, how can there be avidya, because avidya means there's something other than Brahman, because avidya is not Brahman. That they can't. Anyway, they this is how they justify their philosophy, that the soul is transposing or they're seeing form where there isn't form. Just like when you look in, in a room where there's a, a snake or a rope coiled like a snake and if the light is just right, you can see a snake, literally. And they say that's what the soul is doing in the material world. Snake, the, the, it's illusion. The, the, the snake is illusion. The soul's illusion. It's all illusion. But Jiva Goswami makes three very simple points. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. The first one is that unless you had a conception of snake in your mind before, you couldn't superimpose it onto the rope. 
So there must be some form that we're trans that we're transpo or superimposing, you know, in our vision of material energy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see the illusions like they are. So that's the first point. The second point is that you don't tip, maybe somebody's really mad, but you don't generally see a door to look like a snake. So that means that there must be a similarity in form between the thing you're superimposing and the thing and the, and the form you're superimposing it on. So what the illusion is the mistake of, of thinking that the, the rope is a snake. The snake exists in reality somewhere. The rope exists in reality. But the, the illusion is, the, the, the vivarta, or the illusion is to mistake the rope to be a snake. That's Jiva Goswami's basic, you know, uh, disassembling of Mayavad philosophy. Because they can't explain that, the Mayavad philosophy. They're v expert at juggling Sanskrit grammar, and therefore they can argue your, their way out of it unless you really are fixed in the conclusion. Therefore, you have to be very careful when you talk to actual Mayavadi philosophers. They can be bewildered, even in Mahabhagavat, if you do, listens to the wrong person submissively, they can become bewildered again. Okay. I'm going to shut up then. I've been watching his, the wheels turning, but I can't tell what they're saying. So now we're going to find out. Well, I just first wanted to say that uh, <clears throat> I just want to clarify what I said yesterday because I don't want to make it seem like I was proposing some sort of Mayavad or some strange concept. Oh, no, I'm, I wasn't thinking that. I was just thinking that's a danger if someone doesn't know what you know. Go ahead. Well, I kind of, uh, yeah, I guess just to clarify, I, what I meant was like, I mean, similar to that dream analogy is like you know, the person in the bed is not getting eaten by a tiger, but he's experiencing it still. So the conditioned soul is experiencing he thinks he is. it. He, he thinks, thinks he is. is, whereas the liberated soul knows he's not. Yeah. So uh, sorry if I made That's that right. a little unclear That's right. yesterday. Correct. Thank um, you for that clarification. <laughs> and then... Uh, I really like that one purport about the two birds in the tree. Uh, that was really amazing. How uh, in the purport, you know, it just made the statements how Krishna is our real friend, and uh, only He knows our actual needs, and only only He can give us real happiness. Which is uh, a really nice um, truth to come back to regularly, mm. uh, so that we can. Uh, I mean, it's something I, f I feel like we, uh, maybe something that I've realized before, but then the tendency is to forget and then get entangled again. And perhaps that's been going on for lifetimes. So it's like this constant Krishna consciousness, remembrance of what does it mean to actually have, as I said, Krishna is supremely Krishna conscious, seeing every, all his parts and parcels as his parts and parcels. And so. Um, Anyways, I just it's a great point. Well, Prabhupada said something about that, maybe that we might even clarify it a little bit more. He said that, you know, the soul is either, you know, in the shadow or in the sun. And he's sometimes in the shadow and sometimes in the sun. It's not that it, there's a gray area in between. So, yeah. Unless we actually are, when, when we're serving Krishna, then that illusion goes away, or at least it goes away enough for us to be able to taste something different. That's the point. 
so it's not that we can just think ourselves, you know, liberated. You know, when we do actually something for Krishna, when we practically do something with, for Krishna with our body and our minds, then Krishna gives us that taste, as you were just saying. Krishna gives the taste, gives the experience. And then, but because mind is very strong and we're very tiny, we sometimes go, you know, we forget, and then we'll do something for, that's not devotional service, and then we will feel, again, confused. And again, this is the explanation for why a neophyte devotee is sometimes feeling happy and feeling not, and then even they can sometimes think, oh, this Christian consciousness doesn't work because sometimes I'm happy and sometimes I'm not, but I'm supposed to be always happy if I'm Christian, in Christian consciousness. So this process must not work. So I'll just go back and enjoy because then cause it's really stupid because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> even the so-called happiness then is actually suffering, miserable. Whenever you, I, a new devotee is going to bloop and they, they come to me for counseling, I'll say, look, you know, stick around because at least it comes and goes and you get some relief. If you go out there, you won't get any relief. And then you usually go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, I'll stay for a while longer and see. So if we, ju if we not that we think ourselves um, like it's a thought exercise, but if we actually act, as you said, with mind, body, and words. Yes, if as Krishna's actually, if eternal we actually servant, do devotional service, if you actually do what you're doing for Krishna's pleasure, not for your own pleasure, then you immediately feel happy, a real happiness. And that taste is so different than material happiness that you'll never forget it. Even if you've only had it, had it for a second, <laughs> you'll never forget it. And that's what it means that when you chant Hare Krishna once, you're liberated immediately. It doesn't mean immediately, immediately. It means it's guaranteed that you will be liberated, but it depends on how long it takes you to come to that point of being fixed in that devotional service. That's Krishna's kindness. That's Krishna's kindness. Okay. Dr. Patrick, what do you got for us? I just really liked this purport in verse 6. And you can read most of it. It starts with, Lord Krishna is so kind that he patiently sits in the heart, trying to guide the conditioned soul back home, back to Godhead. Certainly no material friend would remain with his foolish companion for millions of years, <laughs> especially if his companion were to ignore him or even curse him. But Lord Krishna is such a faithful, loving friend that he accompanies even the most demoniac living entity and is also in the heart of the insect, pig, and dog. That is because Lord Krishna is supremely Krishna conscious and sees every living entity as part and parcel of himself. Ah, no, it's supremely just, Krishna conscious because so he nice. sees everybody as a part of himself. Wow. That's so nice. And yeah, just, that's transcendental. I was thinking about how it's we... Um, causing offenses and things even to jivas or con the conditioned souls it's um it's still harder on us because we can understand the difference we can understand the connection with krishna that they have so it, maybe we get a little more of a smack for something like that or maybe more blatant reaction wait, like, wait i didn't do understand we, it so I, I don't understand a, just a conditioned soul so if we are like a, offensive to a jiva or even a devotee more so we still get uh, we get a reaction kind of more blatant to our face because of it because we know the difference we can understand. Oh, oh I see, I see. That yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. That's the point about the the parma hunks and the pig. They're they're happy, and everybody else in between is miserable. And until we become fixed in devotional service, and we may go back and forth, you know, and when we get that ex that realization. Then it, yeah, like you said, it hits us in the face because it's we know better. Yeah, that's right. That's good. The 
I'd like to point out how Honest John is so faithful and so attached to hearing that even after work he comes here to hear. I mean, that's far out, if you ask me. Well, you guys wake up earlier than me and do your do your thing, so and y'all can still make it here. So that's your humility speaking. <laughs> Thanks. According to okay, the Lord is the only eternally free living entity, and all other living entities are eternally dependent and bound mm. to the Lord, either this through blissful loving service or through the bondage of Maya. Mm. Mm. The conditioned soul should give up tasting the bitter fruits of the tree of material existence and turn his, to his dear most friend Krishna, who is sitting within his heart. There is no pleasure equal to or greater than the pleasure of pure devotional service. Mm. So you're you're bound to Krishna either way you go. Yeah, there you go. It could be a good experience or a bad experience. There you go. You make the, the choice. There you go. So I, I like that. That was, you know, you're, you're coming with me, so you might as well, you know, make it back to Godhead and let's not be wrapped up in my either way you go. You yeah, you, know, you have to be controlled, in other words. Yeah. You know, you, you have to be controlled. You, you never be, give up being controlled. Never. But on one hand, you're being controlled by love, on the other hand, you're being controlled by fear and being forced but but it's not that when you become liberated you stop being controlled you're always under, you're always under Krishna's control no yeah where you're at. yeah but in spiritual it's out of love so it's not like it's not the same quality of control as here but the an analogy is being given there, that we can consider ourselves, you know, eternally conditioned souls, because we're always going to be controlled by Krishna, eternally. Go ahead, Prana. Take us further. Go ahead. Do it. Do it. I was just going to say that. <clears throat> I mean, it might be. Uh, it might. It may occur that someone may. Uh, misuse the uh, understanding of like the vision of an Uttama Adhikari mm. to see that everyone's serving Krishna mm. like you just said but the quality is different and so although that that is the topmost vision um, in one sense everyone is serving Krishna but seems like maybe it could be a tendency because apparently like perennially it comes up that you know um, it, it could lead into like sahajism or mayava or something weird where it's like you know we're all serving Krishna so I don't have to follow so strictly something like this like I, I, I've heard that before yeah yeah people don't they misuse that the neophytes will misuse that uh, well therefore Prabhupada said if somebody's claiming to be a liberated soul you can be sure that they're not a liberated soul if someone's claiming to be a liberated soul, you can be sure that that person is a liberated soul. Because liberated souls don't advertise it. I think I mentioned that when I first got that Bhagavad Gita and I started to read it, you know, it was so obvious that Prabhupada was my spiritual master, but because he didn't ever point to himself at all in, in any way in his purports. You never hear him say, just come to me and I'll take you. He talks about the spiritual master, you know, philosophically, this and that. But he, he just doesn't, there's no pride in him. There's no pointing to himself. And even when he preached, it, it, it's, it wasn't that he was speaking in a way to lead the person on, you know, to, to accept him. He just, that wasn't, it was there. It was absent, completely absent. So therefore, you know, when a person says something like that, you can understand he's not. And the other way you can tell is just watch him after he does his thing. <laughs> just keep watching <laughs> and see what he does. And then you'll see he do all, does all kinds of things that aren't, you know, 
in the category of you know being a liberated soul. So yeah, I think I think that the point is well taken that that that, that people do take advantage of that of the ignorance of people in general, or the, the, the conditioned souls in general, the unenlightened souls, and try to mislead them. Like, like for instance, Westerners have a tendency to be naive when it comes to this deep of spiritual philosophy. That's why sometimes we sit there and just kind of, you know, it's very hard even to follow the, these deep spiritual concepts and the trends of thought and how one flows to the other, and how it's meant to enlighten us, and you know, you know, ding, you know, turn on the light bulbs inside, and you know. So Prabhupada would be, but in in India, there's really people who are very, very. Uh, their way of being cunning is they can easily take advantage of Westerners' innocence. In other words, naivety, because they know so much philosophical things. So probably used to protect us. I think I said that the other day. He used to protect us when we first went to India. He would be very careful to protect us against, you know, people who looked like, you know, they were like Prabhupada, but wasn't. They weren't, <laughs> you know. Yeah, because it, you, I get back to your point that if, if a person's seeing that everyone is serving Krishna, then he doesn't preach. But he he also doesn't, sometimes he does. You know, these liberated souls that you hear in the Bhagavatam where, you know, one of our acharyas runs up against, like Yadu runs against the Avaduta Brahman, he's just laying there, and Vlad Maharaj came in, the, what was it? What was his name? Avanti Brahma? No. Oh, what was the, the name? Uh, Python man. Python, yeah. Just sitting there with his mouth open. Yeah. And you know, th that's the way he ate. Anyway, that's poet, poet, poetic way of saying it. You know. But uh, but it's it's it, they really are seeing the material energy as energy of Krishna. They are actually seeing Krishna. They're actually seeing, you know, probably Krishna's leela of conducting the material world. They're actually seeing that. Therefore, it's not that they're. Am I making myself clear? Am I just. Therefore, they have to come down. It's not that they come down from being Paramahansas, but their their vision has to come down so they can discriminate who's a devotee and who's not a devotee to preach. It seems like their vision is just broader and it doesn't and it doesn't negate the fact that some souls are, as we heard the terms being defined, conditioned or liberated. That their vision becomes more broad, kind of like Krishna is seeing, like the blink of the eye. It's like ultimately everyone's. Yeah, but again, but again, it's practical. Mm -hmm. You know, if you watch them, they don't engage in sense gratification. Mm -hmm. So if you watch these characters who are claiming to be, you know, liberated souls, and you watch them carefully, they're, they're engaging in sense gratification. But persons who are on that platform, they don't engage in sense gratification. And even if it looks like they are, you you can you can a person who's in knowledge can see that they're not. So it it, ta it takes one to know one, in other words. This is what this this knowledge is supposed to give us that discrimination, to be able to tell who's actually, you know, genuinely preaching Christian consciousness and who who is just putting on a show in order to make a living or in order to to get power, to get strength, to get control over others, or whatever. It's not for Krishna's pleasure. Therefore, what did Prabhupada say? He said, the person who's most addicted to Krishna, <laughs> that's the person you should go to for, you know, understanding. 
be, if you see that he's actually most addicted to Krishna, he's always hearing and chanting about Krishna and doing something in relationship to Krishna, is always absorbed in devotional service, then you can trust that person. Seven thirty-five. I'm going to turn to a pumpkin in one minute. So before I do that in front of everybody, we'll stop. Anybody on, from cyberspace? It's been a long time since we've had very uh, any comments from cyberspace. Someone left a comment about me moving to the CD tape. Yeah, oh. Did I have any comments? Did oh, you but you didn't hear any. But have you been sh looking at it all along to find? Well, it, yeah, it pops up. I just it oh, you see it when it pops up, so yeah. you see. But you've been keeping your eyes glued the whole time. I look up as it goes and check to make sure there's nothing new. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> Just making sure in the ball, you know, if you're going to be a fact checker, you're going to be a fact checker. All right, thank you so much. All glories to Krishna's instructions to Uddhava. All glories to Uddhava for being so qualified to be able to receive these instructions. And we pray that we can assimilate them and actually come to the point of being able to see through these instructions the reality of this material world so we won't get attached to it even if we have to do our duties in it we won't get too, at too attached Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bol See you tomorrow night same place same time same station right here at the live studios in Radha Lane Is the program tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow's Bhakti uh, uh, Disappearance Day. Appearance. At 7 o'clock. Okay. Five so we, what? 5.30. You tell us. <laughs> Don't ask. Tell us. We're waiting for you to tell us. <laughs> Not think. Tomorrow we're going to be having our reading at 5.30 under direction of Kapitru <laughs> Devi Dasi, who's keeping track of things, unlike most of us. <laughs> Yes. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow, 5.30 Central Time, USA. Hare Krishna. Glory to Prabhupada.